For 2015, what I talked a lot about was uh, the possibility that equity crowdfunding was going to turn out to be an enormous, enormous force inside of this whole space. You know, I, I gave a very ambitious, very aggressive talk. But it was basically just equity crowdfunding is going to change everything. Get ready, here it comes. And sure enough, you know, we've got $160 million equivalent in an equity crowdfunding type platform called the DAO, which was started right here in the UK by the Swocket guys. So with that kind of emboldening my sense that I want to make some predictions, I'm going to try and talk about what I think the next year will hold in the entire crypto space as a little bit of a kind of state of the union. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, uh, I was, um, I'm currently with Consensus Systems as uh, basically a strategic architect, which means I spend the majority of my time figuring out how to explain these technologies to diverse audiences in a way that will allow them to actually make decisions. Uh, and a lot of that is getting people away from the idea that you have to understand what mining is or exactly what a gas limit is before you can go out there and actually develop some ideas about how to use this stuff. People seem to love the low-level explanation. They always get pulled down into the low-level explanation. But actually, we don't do that for the majority of our technology. If you think of something like the LAMP stack, you know, everybody uses the LAMP stack or the mean stack. Nobody ever really worries about SQL query optimization theory. And that's kind of where we are with the explanations of these things, which are very oriented around mining or even proof of stake. Everybody wants to get to this super low level understanding of what's happening in a way that they don't for the technologies that they're already used to. They don't really care. Uh, prior to this, I was the release coordinator for Ethereum. So I basically project managed the launch of the software. And that involved an awful lot of time worrying about those kind of low level details, but not nearly as much time as the programmer spent worrying about them. So with that as preface, um, I want to basically talk a little about the singularity, and then I want to talk a little about why I don't think it's happening. Could you raise your hands if you've heard of the singularity? OK, about half of you. So the singularity is an American concept that took root in Silicon Valley maybe 10 years ago. And the singularity basically suggests that you're going to get to artificial intelligence. The first artificial intelligence will be used to design the next artificial intelligence. And pretty soon, you'll have super intelligent artificial general intelligences which could do everything that a human can do but better, and which exists delocalized across the internet in a way which is very reminiscent of the blockchain. And at that point, humans will basically be obsolete, and we should make way for our new robot overlords. Now, for me, the singularity was a very unreal concept until about six months ago, when suddenly London caught up with the singularity. There were a couple of pieces of big news uh, the deep learning stuff where you kept seeing these weird dog lizards come out of this. You see this Google's deep mind thing, all these weird dog lizards? So that stuff, the uh, stuff where you took a painting and then a photograph and then redid the painting in the style of the photograph. Uh, sorry, the, and you know, so redid the photograph in the style of the painting. That stuff was amazing. Uh, and then the victory of computers over the Go game. This very old Chinese board game, which had been one of the high watermarks for artificial intelligence. Oh my God, if we ever crack, Go will almost be there. And most of the people I know that were close watchers of AI found that that had happened 10 to 15 years before they would have predicted it had happened. It was a generational jump within a few years. So that confluence of forces put the singularity back on the table for me in a very real way. And I had to sit down and really have a think about whether or not I thought the singularity was happening, whether or not I thought it was important. And I sat down and had a think, and I came to the conclusion that I don't think I give a monkeys. Okay. And let me explain why. I think that artificial intelligence is probably coming. I think it will be niche intelligence long before it's general intelligence. But niche intelligence, I mean things like it knows how to pack boxes, or it knows how to identify molecules using a mass spectrometer. General intelligence is you could give it a, an entirely new problem domain, and it will figure out a way forward. OK, so let's try and teach you ancient Greek. You don't know any ancient Greek, figure out how to learn it. Machines that can figure out how to learn are basically the core of general intelligence. Um, my belief, and I'm waiting to be proved wrong on this, but I think, I think I'll, we can give it a try, is that artificial general intelligence passed about an IQ of 150 to 180 will turn out to be just as bonkers as people are at those kind of IQs. 
We all know very intelligent people have a terrible tendency to prove to themselves something is true, which is obviously not true, but they're so skillful at manipulating the evidence and marshalling arguments that they convince themselves and then they convince other people. And pretty soon you get a UFO cult or ancient aliens or neoconservatives. Um, so this sort of model that the more intelligent people are, the greater the tendency is to, for them to self-convince themselves of false positives is why I don't think we're going to see artificial superintelligence. I think you might get attempts at artificial and superintelligence, and I think that their tendency to be just completely insane will greatly limit their utility in the real world. You might wind up with a few special instances where people are attempting this kind of stuff, but I think in general we're going to discover that AI is a poor substitute for systems that evolved over a billion years to trade off very skillfully the balance point between intelligence and craziness. Um, however, what you could get is very, very, very fast intelligence that was relatively limited. And the prospect that you could wind up with extremely intelligent machines that do your job 100,000 times faster than you do and much cheaper is very realistic, particularly for people that are pushing paper for a living. So the reason that I wanted to frame that is a lot of times we talk about this blockchain stuff as if it is going to single-handedly be the end of civilization. And actually, it's only one of about seven or ten horsemen of the apocalypse that are all marching over the horizon really, really, really quickly and are tearing apart the very fabric of our expectations about reality far faster than even young people can cope. For example, uh, virtual reality gear was something that you would see maybe once or twice a year. Now you see it basically every time you go to a conference and if there's any sufficiently large gathering of nerds, somebody has VR kit in their backpack and they'll get it out if you even mention the term. Right? So by the time all this gear is launched from Facebook and from Samsung and from Sony and from everybody else when it's on the market and you can buy it and they're launching games and it's being reviewed in the magazines and you can buy it in Dixon's and all the rest of that stuff. At that point, VR is going to be something that you'll see four or five times a day. There'll be people sitting wearing VR headsets on the bus on the way to work. There'll be people sitting down in corners of McDonald's plugging into the end matrix to see exactly what's happening, right? You'll go home and your kids won't remember your name, right? And you know, I, I talk about Christmas 2016 as being the last Christmas anybody will see their children because they're all gonna get VR gear for Christmas and then the next Christmas, you're not gonna be able to get them back out of the matrix to talk to you. And if you think it's hard taking them off Facebook, imagine what it's gonna be like pulling them backward out of Lord of the Rings. Excuse me, we're about to get rid of the one ring. You can't take me out, it's really important. Yeah. So the artificial intelligence, the virtual reality, the drones, the robots, um, you know, what else is moving in this direction? The, the nanotech, the biotech, the life extension stuff, which gets into the biology, which I'm not gonna really touch on, just know it's there. Um, all of these things are basically pushing us outside of what has been the traditional understanding of technology, which was technology was stuff that you could see and feel and touch. It was machines, it was gadgets. And what's happening is that we're beginning to break out of the model where technology was gadgets and into this new world in which technology basically constitutes an environment. And that shift from gadget-centric to, to environmental, we've talked about this in terms of things like Internet of Things, we've talked about it in terms of things like ambient computing, uh, sensor networks, it's bounced around for a long time. But the bottom line is that we're moving into a world in which the kind of techno world is wrapped around us continuously at all times, and it's increasingly a single integrated mass. So you look at something on Amazon, you put it into your shopping cart, you decide you're not gonna buy it quite yet. The next time you go to Facebook, there are 38 copies of it looking at you. I don't remember putting that there, right? It, even worse, you buy the thing and there are still 38 copies of it on Facebook following you around. They must be wasting a trillion dollars a year advertising products that people have already just bought. And unless there's some sneaky reason they're doing it, it's just an example of a bug in the software, a bug in the paradigm. So, these environmental technologies are already wrapped around us. But how much more powerful does that become when you begin to get artificial intelligence, blockchains and AI <clears throat> smoothly operating as a seamless surface? You have your goggles 
and you look into a virtual world and the stuff in the virtual world is directly connected to a blockchain. So when you sell something to somebody or give something to somebody, it really is property that has been transferred to them and not even the NSA can reverse the transaction. The thing is sold. There are no, you know, no rules by which the game masters of the game can reach into your pockets and unpick them. The stuff is gone. And if that is then you know, integrated into your mobile phones and your thermostats and your everything else, you know, your house lights flash when your castle is under attack in virtual reality, and you go over there and sure enough, you, know, you check your blockchain inspector and half of your stuff is already gone, now you have a problem, you phone up your friends, they all leave the party they're at to get online so that they can go and chase down the orcs that have stolen all your virtual property in your imaginary game. You know, this kind of sounds like comedy, but I guarantee you that you're going to be reading the scary news about this kind of stuff in the red top newspapers within six months or a year. Certainly next year or the year afterwards. I think the narrative that the blockchain is a singular breakthrough is going to be replaced by a much more general understanding that the entire world is changing really, really quickly in some totally unexpected ways. Um, smart contracts, I think, are going to be a huge part of that transformation process. Um, could I have a show of hands for everybody that's comfortable with a smart contract? Okay, so I'm going to spend a wee bit of time explaining smart contracts. I don't want to talk for too long, but you know, try and, try and get with some of the detail in place. So, when I take a little detour and teach you all how to explain blockchains to people that don't understand blockchains, would that be useful? Mm -hmm. If you can remember how, to, you know, how this explanation works, it will make everything that you're doing a ton easier. So, Start in the 1970s, and we all get to smart contracts, by the way, but this is the easiest way of getting to smart contracts. Start in the 1970s, one computer per organization. The computer is a big, fragile machine in a big, clean room, and people wear white coats and funny little hairnets because if a stray hair gets into the tape drives, the tape drives are an inch thick and like 600 meters long, and if the tape gets tangled up in a hair, it can rip your customer data to pieces. So the machines are treated with extraordinary care because they're incredibly fragile. And that applies both to the hardware and the software. Um, there are stories about machines that crashed and it would take three or four days for a team to, you know, they would fly out, they'd sit with the machine, they'd spend three or four days reconstructing what had happened line by line by line by line before they could even get the mainframe to reboot again. These things were very, very delicate. They get the same kind of care that we would give you know, delicate scientific equipment, particle accelerators. These things were, you know, warp cores, very delicate. So there's a kind of prehistory where these machines were programmed by hand. And if you wanted to do a query that matched data on two tapes to each other, you'd have to run the tapes manually. Okay, advance 11 inches, read record. Advance 16 inches, read record. Are these two records the same? Yes or no? If no, advance 11 inches, get next record check record, and you, you know, you'd write these little programs in COBOL that would process the data, and it was incredibly expensive and difficult to get anything done with computers, but it was still thousands of times easier and cheaper than doing it with paper. This is the prehistory. 1970-something, a guy called Cobb, Cod? Cod, at IBM, comes up with a thing called the relational model, SQL. And SQL takes these tape drives and that entire model of the database and its tables and all the rest of that stuff and says, underlying this, there is a multi-dimensional algebra. Each table is one axis of an enormous cube, 12 table database, 12 dimensional hypercube. Inside of that 12 dimensional hypercube, we can then close off dimensions one at a time until we're left with two dimensions using a simple algebra and that two-dimensional locus that we have defined is the table that will be returned to us as a result of our query. So you start with 11, 12 dimensions. You say where name equals Smith takes away a dimension, where city equals London takes away a dimension, where purchase order equals customer ID takes away a dimension. And you take away the dimensions and you collapse from this 12-dimensional space with infinite data down to Three dimensions, two dimensions, give me those two dimensions as a table, and this is essentially what SQL does. So it tamed this enormously complex you know, set of software and hardware interactions that you had to wade through to get simple things done with your data into an algebra that once you got over the hump of realizing that you were basically canceling off dimensions until you got down to the data you were looking for, was something that ordinary programmers could do pretty easily. 
And the result of that is 20 years later, by the 1990s, you had a handful of really big software companies like Oracle and Sybase that all had their own SQL implementations. There were hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people in the world that could make SQL do more or less anything you wanted it to do. And that generation of machinery had been completely tamed. And it's worth thinking about that because, you know, how domestic and mundane is the SQL database today? Does anybody even think about the multidimensional algebra inside of the thing? Or is it all completely invisible and lost and you just think, why is my join returning enormous amounts of stuff? Right? Your join is returning enormous amounts of stuff because it's iterating over a nine-dimensional space. And it turns out that the volume of nine-dimensional spaces is extremely large. This might be a little technical. So, 70s model, hardware and software are in sync. By the mid-1980s, we get the IBM PC. The IBM PC gives us one computer per person or one computer per desk rather than one computer per institution. And one computer per desk, the personal computer revolution again, completely lost the history. So under the age of about 45, you have no real awareness that one computer per person was a radical concept. You just take one computer per person as completely for granted. If you're under about 35, you think of that one computer per person as being a laptop. The idea that the only computer that person could own would be a desktop and you couldn't use your computer except at home seems completely mysterious. Right? Think back to the age before Wi-Fi. Before Wi-Fi. It's only about 15 years. Right? The point where you had to plug the computers in before there was any network. It's only about 15 years. So, along comes this PC revolution, 1986, 1984, one computer per person. The computers per person model then gets into this question of, well, this isn't very useful because the data I want is on your computer or your computer or your computer. So re to return that data to me where I want to use it, typically, if you're in the same office, I go over with a floppy disk, you put the data on the floppy disk, I take my copy to my computer, and then I work on it. But then your computer and my computer are out of sync because your copy of the data doesn't have the update on it. So I then have to give it back across to you and synchronize it with you. But in the meantime, Bob has come and taken a copy and is working on it on his computer. And none of the software in those days was capable of taking four or five copies of the same file and merging all the changes from all those copies into a single unified status. Even today, that's still a hard problem. You know, Git, for example, is all about that. So that problem continues to be a really core problem for about 10 years, from about 1990 to about 2000, the synchronization problem only gets worse because we do eventually network the computers together, first with Ethernet and local area networks, then with the internet. The web then provides a super user-friendly experience for working on the internet. Remember, the internet is around for a good decade before the web comes along. FTPing postscript files so you can look at people's documents. Do those words even still have meaning? FTP and postscript files, right? File transfer protocols. You would connect to a machine and it would show you a directory listing like the one you would get on your machine. And then you would download a file in our, an archaic language called postscript, which was a series of equations which would describe letter shapes or curves that would make an image. And it would all be rendered either at your screen resolution or for a laser printer. And postscript. You're still using postscript, yeah. I mean, it's inside of... It's inside of, um, for example, PDF is very strongly inspired by PostScript, and PDF is the standard renderer inside of Apple's. All of these technologies have prehistories. So we don't solve the synchronization problem with many copies of the same file going around until we get to the kind of golden age of client-server. Golden age of client-server comes around two or three different times. The golden age recurs and recurs and recurs. One giant computer maintained by somebody else as a service, so you never have to worry about it. Many users connecting to the giant computer so that you can run all your jobs and so on, and the giant computer keeps everything synchronized. It used to be the Oracle mainframe and people would connect with green screens, then it became Google Docs and all the other equivalent services. Even things like Facebook are essentially client server terminal models where you have a single perfect computer that somebody else is responsible for maintaining and you connect to it to do your computing. That paradigm always results in the users getting screwed. Right? 
because so much power is concentrated in the center by the people that own those technologies that it's extremely difficult for the users with their little green screens to get any real leverage on the system. Facebook is very large, your laptop and your web browser are very small. So, to reprise, 1970s, big databases. 1990s, we network the computers together. Initially, we do all of our work by message passing, but message passing results in a synchronization problem. We then solve the synchronization problem in the same way that the synchronization problem has always been solved. Client server architecture, which is the golden age of Google, Facebook, and all the rest of these things. The client server paradigm never dies. It is simply the centralization of power. But you also get a centralization of services. Somebody is responsible for making sure your data survives. Along then comes the great revolution in the form of Bitcoin. Because Bitcoin comes along at the real apex of the client-server paradigm for doing computing and says, actually, we've got something new. Right? We're no longer swinging between you know, the network and the database. We're no longer swinging between peer-to-peer -peer and client-server. We can have something which has the static shared picture of reality that you get from the best client-server systems so not the anarchy of message passing, but something that does not create a powerful center which will then extract $100,000 a year as a use fee from your company. And that squaring of the circle is really something fundamentally new at an academic computer science level. Nobody had ever managed to figure out how to get a computer system to behave in such a way that you got the best of client server and you got the best of this peer-to-peer -peer stuff as a synchronized whole. Um, and the Bitcoin mining process, which is at the heart of that, is an enormously ugly hack, right? Mining is the worst way of doing this stuff apart from all of the others. It has a lot in common with democracy. It's horrendously expensive. It's messy. It's complicated. People continually attempt to hijack it, and you have to trust the system to sort itself out again. But nonetheless, it continues to provide an approximation of good governance to the point where you can put many, 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 many billions of dollars into those systems and they hold together. So this establishes a new paradigm for how computers can work together. And that new paradigm initially is used to build, on one hand, what sounds very impressive, a central bank of the internet. And on the other hand, something which is incredibly mundane, which is addition and subtraction. And these are the only two operations that Bitcoin really supports. There isn't even a multiply. So we go to all of this work to generate this enormously complicated peer-to-peer -peer architecture, the blockchain with all of its synchronization, all the rest of that. But all you get out of Bitcoin is addition and subtraction. Ethereum comes along, you take this addition and subtraction model, you pull a programming language layer directly into the blockchain. You have to rebuild the blockchain on a new technology to do that, unfortunately. But once you've done that, what you get is programmability in a paradigm which is neither anarchic message passing nor centralized monolithic peer, uh, client server. And that paradigm, I predict, is going to turn out to be the dominant computing paradigm of the next 20 years, in the same way that the database was the dominant paradigm of the 1970s and 1980s, and the network was the dominant paradigm of the 1990s and the 2010s. The teens and the decade following the teens are going to be all about this paradigm of computing where everything is connected to everything else and it's continually synchronized in discrete units of time. The discrete units of time, by the way, are not going to go away. There's a minimum block time which is necessary because of the speed of light. To be able to keep everything synchronized, you have to have the messages go around the world basically twice, and around the world basically twice takes something like 1.4 seconds. <clears throat> So in all probability, you're going to wind up with a minimum block time of about two seconds, might be more of like three, could be as long as five. Ethereum is currently running at 15. But the block is there because the speed of light is actually relatively slow compared to how quickly your computer is able to operate because your computer operates by racing light backwards and forwards over a 0.6 of a centimeter surface, you know, six millimeters of racing. And as the light races backwards and forwards over your processor that's only six millimeters wide, it can cover an enormous amount of computation compared to having to go 5,000 miles to LA and back. So the quantization of time into these blocks is a necessary step for fighting against the speed of light. And as a result, I think the block is going to stay as an institution 
And this is going to become even more pressing when we start doing things like wanting to build computer systems that manage resources which are on the moon or space stations or Mars, where the speed of light delay becomes even longer and even more complicated. How thinking has to be done about how to manage block synchronization. Now, that is a very long explanation of what the blockchain is. But if you pull out the salient points, 1970s are databases, 1990s are networks, we unify the network and the database so that you don't get the anarchy of message passing or the centralization of power from client server, and then we make it programmable by putting a programming language into that system, you're up to date in two sentences, and you can drill down into that explanation as far as anybody needs you to, to be able to get a full set of facts for people if you want them. So, going forward from where we are right now, in kind of state of the union mode, um, I think that what we're going to get is a, an enormous expansion of how much contact ordinary people have with technologies which are beyond their comprehension. And the need to be, be able to take these technologies, figure out what is essentially true about them, and then communicate that to people in a way that will allow them to make intelligent decisions about how the technology affects their life, is going to be enormously key to whether these technologies are hated and feared or whether they're acknowledged, respected, and eventually uh, given a bit of grudging affection. I don't think anybody is going to love these technologies in any kind of mass scale, because I think that we're getting to the point where our human limits are being thrown in our face increasingly by technology. And there's no way until we break into a completely new way of thinking about our relationships with machines that these dialogues are going to be easy at a cultural level. You know, socially, we haven't really recovered from the, um, for example, the invention of television, which is a huge distorting force in our culture. Uh, relationships between men and women have still not settled down after the invention of birth control. It takes us a long time to culturally adapt to a new technology. So we're at a point where you know, VR, AR, and all the other horsemen of the apocalypse are coming right over the horizon. They're impacting our human culture. And our ability to narrate and storytell what those technologies mean to people, not just in a sales way, but in a political or a socio-political dialogue way, is the core of our ability to generate a kind of socio-technical milieu, a, a discussion about the role of tech in society, that will enable us to come to good decisions. So many of the governments in the world are currently putting a ton of effort and energy into looking at what blockchains can do for them. And what most of them have done is they've looked at the blockchain as it was when they had first contact with it, when it was doing a few transactions a second, and if you wanted it to go faster, you needed a permission system, when it had no ability to scale, no ability to encrypt, it had no homomorphic features, it was a relatively limited technology. And they've built a world model based on that technology, and now when you talk to government about blockchain, what you hear is a whole bunch of discussion about the state of the art as it was shortly after Ethereum was launched, which is generally speaking when people first started talking to them about it. If you talk to finance people inside of government, they heard about it two years before that at the uh, peak of the initial noise around Bitcoin. And for them, they're still struggling with the idea that the blockchain is something other than Bitcoin. It's just a transactional medium, right? That doesn't affect us at all. That doesn't help government. So once people lock into their head what a technology is, they get very fixed around that idea and it doesn't leave them much room for understanding that the next time they see that technology, it will wear a different face. And the next time they see it after that, it will wear a different face. And the next time you see it after that, it will wear a different face. Right? And it's not that all of these faces are basically the same face over and over again, like Doctor Who, where it's the same set of capabilities with new graphic design. It's that you actually get an entirely new generation of capabilities. And the jumps are not unfamiliar to us. Right? Phone used to mean an electromechanical box connected to a cable by a wall, uh, sorry, connected to a wall by a cable with you know, something like 48 volts running down it to operate the ringer and the microphone. That used to mean phone. Then phone became something like a little Nokia with a bunch of buttons on it, and it was wireless, but it didn't have any web access. Then phone meant something with a little screen that you, know, you could just about browse a WAP site on. Then phone became something with all of those features and a camera and a video recorder and an MP3 player. And then it became, you know, phone. And if you pick up somebody's modern phone, you know, iPhone 6, 
Samsung S7, something along those kind of lines, what you have is a very, very functional laptop that they left the keyboard off, running an extremely sophisticated operating system that's actually much more user-friendly than your desktop in most cases. And we still refer to this as phone, similarly with blockchain to government or large companies. Blockchain is the first version they saw of it. They're still back wondering, you know, is it a dial tone? Hands up if you haven't actually ever heard a telephone dial tone. Right? It's a, it's a thing which has become part of the past. The static that you see at the beginning of HBO shows, you know, that was cosmic rays interacting with electric wire loops called antenna. Right? You see it on YouTube as well. The actual original mechanism which gave rise to that static is long gone. You know, why do you have a 3D printout of the save icon? <laughs> oh, that's actually a floppy disk. Oh, it's a floppy disk. Right? So, one of the things that we have to start teaching people when we introduce them to a new technology is we have to introduce them to the idea that they're getting on a ride which is going very steeply up a curve. So this is this thing called the blockchain. Today it looks like this. Tomorrow it will look a little different. The day after that it will look different again. And five to ten years from now we expect it to be kind of sort of something like this. And introducing people to the idea that what you're showing them is a little seedling in a pot for a tree that will be 100 meters tall with roots that go down 35 feet. You know, that sort of thinking is quite difficult for us to do because what we're introducing people to is not objects, we're introducing them to processes. This is the blockchain process. It's an evolutionary system that will produce a bunch of different technologies one after another, and that evolutionary system is self-funding to the tune of several billion dollars. It has hundreds of activists that have made enough money from that process to be able to work on anything they like for the next three to five years, some of them for the rest of their lives. And that socio-technical system will continue to generate enormously sophisticated artifacts, each one building on top of the one before it, until we're at a point where there's nothing immediately visible that you want to add. So we know that at point X, where X might be five to 10 years in the future, we will have a blockchain system that works at five, 10, 15, 50% of the speed of all the computers in the network put together. So if you have 100,000 computers, it will be 50,000 times faster than the fastest computer in the network, maybe. It will probably be programmable in a bunch of different languages and a bunch of different paradigms. It will probably host limited artificial intelligences, and it will probably be interwoven with almost any device that you can imagine it being interwoven with. And that blockchain, to some people occasionally we refer to it as Skynet, is completely inevitable as soon as you have the blockchain that we have today, plus enough money for people to continue to build it, because every step towards that technology is profitable to take, and there is no regulatory framework which can stop people creating those technologies. And I don't mean this in a kind of fist-waving, fight-the-state, old Bitcoin libertarian way. I simply mean that we don't have any regulatory framework as a society for globally rejecting a technology because we don't like its implications. The last time we managed that was uh, CFCs to protect the ozone layer, and that was a very, very rare, like once in a century moment of cohesive action from global government. On things like carbon emissions, we've done nothing. On genetic engineering of you know, organisms that we release into the environment, we have no real structural planning. So the fact that it's almost certain that we will wind up with a blockchain which looks like that tells us nothing about the paths that we could take to get there. We know that it will be an awful lot of writing code. We probably know the names and faces of many of the people that will be at the core of that process, but who is to say whether the people that begin the race will be the ones that finish it? There may be several generations of technologists and new ideas in there, or it may be built directly on top of the Ethereum platform and proceed as a linear set of breakthroughs from Vitalik. Could go either way. Uh, personally, I think my money is still on Vitalik because he's amazing, but you know, it's open to discussion, it's open to doubt, it's open to people bringing their code. As we begin to talk about the blockchain as evolutionary steps towards this kind of integrated global computing surface, right, we could go back to the story about how to explain it. One computer per organization, one computer per person, many computers per person, which is where we're at now, finally one computer per world. All the one computer per person stuff 
becomes woven together. The cloud gives us a metric for many computers per person being woven into a cohesive whole. We go beyond the cloud into this blockchain, and this blockchain takes all the stuff that was done for your computing in the cloud and connects it into a single massive global enterprise. And that single global massive enterprise looks almost exactly like the internet, but now you can make payments on it. And if you give somebody a copy of a picture, only they get to see that picture. So for ordinary people, it may be that by the time we've built this essentially perfect global computer network, all that they see is that the internet payment stuff is secure, the credit card stuff is no longer continually getting broken, their passwords don't get hacked, and life goes on with a series of little sequential improvements. But underneath that, we take a 50, 60 year old architecture for connecting computers together, and we pull it out from the existing internet and we replace it with a fully you know, cryptographic distributed architecture without really breaking the user services that go on top. And this is basically much the same process as we did with the phone. We took the phone, we got rid of the wire, but to get rid of the wire, we had to pull the entire old phone network to pieces and we had to replace it with the mobile network. To get from there to the phone as a kind of web browsery thing, we had to pull out the entire operating system and processors from the old phones, and we had to reshell that around these little mobile supercomputers that we now call telephones. So there are several examples of the things that you touch every single day of your life that have gone through this process of taking an existing interface paradigm and an existing story, pulled out the technology, put the new technology underneath it without the user really seeing a blip. And this is my fundamental kind of state of the union prediction for what's going to happen with the blockchain. I think the blockchain story is going to seamlessly fuse into the web and the internet as we get things like the Brave, Brave browser, which is a browser with a Bitcoin wallet built in and ad blocking. And that was done by the guy that invented JavaScript. So the notion that you'll simply see web browsers grow crypto features and crypto browsers grow web features and the whole thing kind of fuses together around something like IPFS. You know, some bank will issue a stable coin on the dollar that's tied to your account. You can use it with a credit card and, you know, your payments stop making you feel exposed because you know where the money's going. You know, whitelisted addresses inside of some private blockchain network, maybe. And what you will see is that the fuss around the blockchain as a separate technology will gradually go away as it simply begins to re-inhabit all of the Internet of Things devices, all of the web browsers, all of the bank transaction processing, and most of the cases where you need any kind of secure computation, which could well be things like one-time uh, key logins or um, uh, two-factor authentication. And once you realize that all of those technologies are running on the same deep interconnected infrastructure platform called the blockchain, or whatever we wind up calling it, it becomes apparent that we've gone through an enormous civilizational upgrade of our computing infrastructure, but without having to break all of the existing paradigms. So I think, and I feel a little exposed saying this, I mean, I feel like I'm going out on a whim, but I think that the blockchain hype about blockchain as a separate technology will not live out the rest of this year. I think instead, what you will see is an enormous amount of transfer of focus to actual blockchain applications that people are using on a day-to-day -day basis, and browser-like entities which are connecting to the underlying blockchains, but people will relate to the browser-type entity as what they're using rather than the underlying technology that powers it. For example, everybody knows that they're using Chrome or Firefox. Nobody really understands that what they're really using is the Apache web browser. So the blockchain becoming something which sits in the background and seamlessly and silently powers all of these technological upgrades as we take old broken things and replace them with new fixed things, that's my prediction for the next year. I think by the end of this year, there'll be four or five massive products which are becoming seen as being you know, the central points of blockchain awareness and people will realize that this is the blockchain, you know, it's finally arrived, but by the time it arrived, nobody talked about the blockchain anymore. They just talked about this new improved web experience they were having. They just talked about the fact that they no longer had to worry about logging in with password, passwords. They began to talk about like how easy it was to do electronic banking these days. And the notion that part of what happens as we begin to succeed is that you stop seeing your banners flying up over the ramparts where the fight is happening, and instead you see little logos stuck onto the sides of devices when you go down into the market to buy things, 
this is victory, right? Becoming invisible and becoming part of the weave of society is what happens when you grow from being a kind of little fortress at the edge of the horizon uh, to being a major established part of the integrated network of global trade and finance. And I think that by the time I come back to talk at Wales 2017, that process will have advanced so far that we wonder why we're talking about blockchain instead of talking about this amazing thing over here, you know, Mist 4.0, oh my God, have you seen the VR integration? So um, I think I've got two little points and then I'll wrap up. So the first thing I want to stress is that success in these kind of revolutionary technological changes is often really, really unimpressive. Uh, does anybody know who wrote the mobile phone operating system that they're carrying around in their pockets? Right? Yeah, nah, nah, nah. yeah, maybe, you know, bits and pieces, right? I and mean, certainly, you know, there was some code in there for Linus, but I bet it's 10% of the code in your Android. 5%, right? So, you know, firstly, nobody really notices the infrastructure once it becomes infrastructure. We generate these great leaders and these great heroes at the early stages of the revolution, but once you're fully integrated into the global weave, there isn't really a name for your heroes anymore. They're just people that run companies that build things. So the point where we were generating these enormous heroic leader figures in the blockchain age, I suspect, is going to draw to a close. This is not a sign of failure. This is a sign of victory. Um, the second thing is the relationship with the state. And we've really taken a deep toll from libertarian activism around Bitcoin. You know, we had a bunch of guys running around painting targets on themselves on the White House lawn, you know, waving flags, waiting for the Secret Service to come and get them to show that they were cool and hard. And it hasn't happened because, generally speaking, the reaction from the state to Bitcoin has kind of been like, could I use that to fix my banks? Mm. Interesting. And this is not the reaction that people were ready for at all because what they expected was to fight and lose. What they weren't ready for was victory. And because victory didn't look like burning down this White House, victory looked like being invited in the front door to come and talk about how this stuff was going to integrate into society, people have gotten confused between winning and selling out, right? There is no selling out, right? Becoming part of mainstream society instead of being a little fortress off on the horizon is total victory, right? If there's going to be some kind of large scale discontinuous social change within my lifetime, I expect it to be globalization and I expect it to be led by climate justice. I don't think it's going to be a libertarian meltdown of everything, and I think it's likely to be a fundamental renegotiation about how we manage the planet as a single ecosystem, in spite of the fact that geographically we're divided up into nation states when it comes to paying taxes. Right? Maybe the UN starts taxing mega corporations, and we wind up with a global government that has some teeth as a result. Maybe we start giving people individual carbon wallets, and all the carbon that you emit is gradually piled up in your carbon wallet, and you've got too much carbon you can't buy and sell anymore without paying a huge tax. Almost anything could happen. And I'm sure that this kind of integrated techno social weave thing that I'm describing will include many features from the blockchain technology. Blockchain and climate is going to be as much of a discussion as blockchain and identity is right now. But it'll take a few years for it to mature because the climate people have not yet gotten blockchain as a religion yet. But once they do, they're going to be all over this stuff in the same way that the identity people are currently all over it. Uh, by the way, let me give a little plug for Uport, which is a consensus identity product. It's really well thought out. Finally, right, our role in that revolution is two things. Firstly, during those revolutions is quite a good time to make enough money to buy a house. That's a really good use of your 15 years or five years or 10 years in the spotlight. You know, real estate has always been what people did as soon as they made a bunch of fast money, if they were smart. If they were dumb, they kept it in fast money and waited for it to double by another five times. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But this notion that we move into the mainstream and get relatively ordinary lives, rather than running around with you know, tens of millions of dollars floating around on laptops, which people then lose once in a while. You know, the field is aging, the field is maturing, the field is growing up. I don't want to say that the age of shenanigans is at an end, but the people that were really at the bleeding edge of the shenanigans have been at that bleeding edge for a decade, and it's no longer 21-year-old kids running around breaking the future with their amazing libertarian cryptocurrency. 
The big guys have arrived, the old guys have arrived, people that were young have grown up, the people that are arriving are no longer at the absolute frontier, they're joining some other generation's revolution, and the entire field is beginning to stabilise into something which has enough mature players, even among the early adopters, they've had enough time to grow up and mature, that they're getting to the age where they can integrate into the fundamental processes of culture and state. So I don't want to declare the revolution is over and we've won, but I think that the integration process is now going to be largely social because the general direction of the technology is well understood and well set and many smart people are working on it. The real question is how do we make a deal with the existing powers that allows us to smoothly integrate into society in the same way the internet barons did. Uh, and that's my prediction for next year. See you in 2017.